The Counter-Revolution of 1776, Slave Resistance and the Origins of the United States of America By Gerald Horn 1. Rebellious Africans How Caribbean Slavery Came to the Mainland The news from Barbados was frightening. In 1676, a Londoner reported breathlessly about the bloody tragedy intended against His Majesty's subjects there at the hands of the heathen, the Negroes. Fortunately, it was said, the conspiracy was miraculously discovered eight days before the intended murder was planned. An orgy of beheadings and immolations of Africans, particularly those designated as Coromantee or Gold Coast Negro, ensued, but this bloodshed was insufficient to wash away fearful apprehension about what could befall this small island. For the Africans not only sought to eliminate the European settlement and establish their own polity in its stead, they also intended, said one contemporaneous writer, to spare the lives of the fairest and handsomest women, their mistresses and their daughters, to be converted to their own use. The authorities sought to quarantine the contagion by ordering that no Negroes concerned in the late rebellion or convicted of other crime in Barbados be permitted to be bought or sold. There was fear of what would occur if these Africans wound up in neighboring Jamaica, but this was a difficult mandate to observe when African labor was so needed beyond this island's borders. By importing Africans in such ratios to the point where they grossly outnumbered settlers, the crown was riding a tiger. It was hard to dismount and harder still not to do so. The colonial governor, Sir Jonathan Atkins, was convinced that foul play was planned by the Africans. Their damnable designs, he asserted, was to destroy them all, meaning those like himself. A more thorough inquiry found this conspiracy far more dangerous than was at first thought for it had spread over most of the plantations, especially amongst the Coromantee Negroes, who are much the greater number from any one country and are a warlike and robust people. Perhaps Africans should be dragooned from elsewhere, but that could mean enhanced conflict in Africa with the French, Spanish, and other competitors. Just a few years earlier, the Dutch had burnt to the ground an English encampment in West Africa with considerable loss. Perhaps inspired, the Africans on an island near Gambia rebelled against the European invaders in their midst, and in the resultant unrest, almost three dozen of the English were slain and about the same number of Africans. At this juncture, even the densest and least observant Londoner might have wondered about the costs of colonialism. However, as things turned out, rebellious Africans in the Caribbean did not cause London to abandon colonialism but, instead, to move more assets northward to the mainland, as a host of settlers from Barbados simply moved to South Carolina. London feared that small islands, more so than the more spacious mainland, could more easily fall victim to internal revolt by the enslaved, coupled with external attack by competing European powers. This was a reasonable assumption, though London was to find that South Carolina too was not altogether exempt from attack by Africans aided by Madrid, underscoring the difficult dilemma faced by settlers. Increasingly, settlers were referring to their principal labor force as intestine enemies, a deadly threat that could not be easily expelled or digested. Moreover, as the number and importance of enslaved Africans grew on the mainland, as Caribbean colonists and their valued property made the great trek to Carolina and points northward, predictably there was a concomitant nervousness about the ultimate rebellious intentions of these manacled workers. In any case, London should not have been surprised by a murderous turn of events. In 1649, a plot by the enslaved was discovered that called for the planter class in Barbados to be eliminated and, as it was reported, their wives to be kept for the chief of the conspirators, their children and white servants to be their slaves. A full century before the famed lurch for independence in 1776, it seemed that other dreams of independence were brewing. The subjugation and settling of the Caribbean in particular and also the mainland was a riotous and chaotic process accompanied by frequent plots and conspiracies involving not just the usual suspects, the indigenous and Africans, but, as well, Irish and Scots. This chaos provided opportunities for arbitrage and leverage for all concerned, the Africans not least. Ultimately, Conflagrations in the Caribbean were to drive London to focus more on the mainland, but this did not provide a long-term remedy. It was almost as if the settlers were deeply equivocal when it came to Africans. For a few decades earlier, the Bahamian elite had complained that there were too many Negroes in their midst and sought to transport quite a number to Bermuda, 
and Virginia, both of which had Negro problems all their own. A similar plot by the enslaved had been uncovered in Bermuda in 1673, near Christmas Day, a familiar day of revolt for Africans in the Americas. A result? The colony's free Negro population was effectively expelled, which narrowed the base of support for the colonial project, necessitating the importation of, perhaps, more unsteady Scots and Irish. A decade earlier, the authorities in recently claimed Jamaica already were hedging against the possibility of an African mutiny. Undaunted, in 1682, recently imported enslaved Africans from Jamaica, brought to Bermuda, devised a far-reaching plan to organize brigades and murdered leading planters during Sunday religious services, then flee via the highway that was the vast sea. Settlers were in a quandary since the well-founded fear of external attack meant incorporating Africans in the militia, but this decision could well give succor to the idea that the oppressed should deploy their martial skills against the local elite. This fear of Africans using their weight in colonialism and numerical superiority to turn the tables on the Europeans was a lurking fear during this era, signaled, for example, in 1682 when leading English official William Blathwaite warned darkly about the rise of piratical Negroes. Runaways were known to hide in the woods, waiting to rob or murder Europeans. By late 1675, the authorities in Jamaica, which only had been seized from the Spanish two decades earlier, were fretting about several insurrections and rebellions of late by the enslaved. The planters were instructed to take care to provide themselves with one white servant for every ten Negroes on their plantations, but left unsaid was where these whites would be found who would be sufficiently intrepid to reside among angry insurrectionists. Almost through absence of mind, but actually driven by the desperation of mere survival, the base of support for colonialism was expanded to include groups often disfavored in London itself, for example, those who were Jewish and the Irish, now admitted into the hallowed halls of a form of colonial whiteness. In other words, the ethnic discrimination of the British Isles had difficulty in withstanding murderous uprisings of the Africans and indigenous, and the ineluctable adaptation in the colonies was a grouping together of Europeans in the evolving racial category that was whiteness. This process facilitated the degradation and subjugation of a recalcitrant African labor force. Yet, ultimately, racial formation was not a long-term solution to London's thorny problems in the Caribbean, not least since it was hard to override by fiat or otherwise the Protestant-Catholic divide. Thus, the undeterred authorities in Barbados quickly moved to increase the supply of servants from Scotland to strengthen the island against the outrages of the Negroes, but casting increasingly restive Scots into this turmoil was not necessarily a formula for calm repose. A further suggestion was loosening barriers on trade between the island and New England, but far-sighted Londoners might have seen that this could only bolster independent sentiments on the mainland. In 1683, on the island of St. Helena in the South Atlantic, the governor was murdered, and the enslaved were enmeshed in seemingly perpetual plots involving poisoning. That same year, yet another plot was uncovered in Barbados, and between 1685 and 1688, dozens of enslaved Africans were executed for various acts of sedition. Then in 1692 yet another major plot was revealed, as the Africans were planning to revolt on the plantations of Barbados, then move toward the urban node that was Bridgetown, where they intended to capture the fortifications, assume control, and dispense an uncertain fate to the settlers, hundreds were arrested, while dozens were executed. An army of enslaved Africans intended to take advantage of the chaos of war to stage a rebellion and form their own polity, which would depend on the assistance of Irish servants as well as the French. Adding fuel to the fire was the seeming reality that as the crisis in London mounted, leading to the glorious revolution of 1688, tensions in the colonies proceeded accordingly. In the late 17th century, Barbados was gripped with nervousness over reports of rebellions by Africans, of which the preceding examples were merely the tip of a larger iceberg. After all, by this point many of the enslaved could understand quite well the language of the enslaver and the reports that filtered in from various vessels and overheard at dinner tables. Ultimately, however, the mutually intelligible language best understood by the Africans and the colonizers alike was the language of force. The colonizers were encountering violent resistance at the source of their labor supply, Africa. Near Witta in 1686, the would-be enslaved engaged in a shipboard insurrection that, 
it was reported with sadness, led them to kill all the white men. Near Accra in 1695, the would-be enslaved rose again and massacred their captors, though the Africans too absorbed major casualties. Of course, tension in London was nothing new either, as various Catholic plots had become a staple of the 17th century that a significant Catholic population resided in Barbados contributed to the combustibility, as many of these servants were convicted political rebels banished from Ireland. There was reason to believe that this group were involved in plots to massacre island elites in 1634 and 1647. Regional unrest in the 1650s was followed by regional revolts in the mid-1660s, connected to warfare in the Leeward Islands. There was a depressing suspicion in London that these servant revolts in the Caribbean were coordinated with foreign invasions, devised by, for example, France and Spain, which could only accelerate the growing fear that such a fate could befall England itself. Such was the conclusion during this tumultuous era after the French invaded Antigua and Montserrat, when a combination of Irish insurgents and invaders plundered and burned both colonies. Protestant English planters with sizable holdings ruled Montserrat, while the Irish were small tobacco farmers, as the hierarchy of Europe was replicated in the Caribbean, which proved to be unstable in both sites. The Irish presence complicated the attempt to construct a smoothly synthetic white solidarity, which made more complex the overriding objective of exploiting African labor. That the Irish could, and did, defect to Catholic invaders did little to dissuade the developing notion that, perhaps, the mainland, with a more diverse and substantial European population, was a preferable site for investment. Yet in 1689 in Maryland, there was frantic discussion concerning a confederacy with ye papists and Indians to destroy Protestants that mirrored Montserrat. A decade later, a general insurrection by the Indians was feared in this and neighboring provinces, and though Catholic, or Papist, influence was not noted, surely they and their external allies could have taken advantage easily of this situation. During this same era, Nevis and St. Christopher in the Caribbean were under constant threat from the French, a threat that was magnified not only by the presence of alienated Africans, but by problems in supplying these distant outposts, leading to what Sir William Stapleton referred to as a sad condition featuring the want of armies and ammunition, the soldiers for want of pay and recruits, generally, destitute of everything. In the overriding context of Catholic-Protestant conflict, seizing more Africans for enslavement, while trying to incorporate Irish and other dissidents in the superseding category of whiteness, made sense, except for the Africans for which this trend was disastrous. Incorporating the Irish was not easy either, not least because of religious rifts. After all, it was in the late 17th century that one Londoner proclaimed haughtily that a papist hates a Protestant worse than he doth all others, just as a Jew hates a Christian far worse than he doth a pagan or a Turk. Actually, this writer, Thomas Gage, might have written that those who were Jewish had reason to resent his Catholic majesty in Madrid, not least because of the Spanish Inquisition, which led to their mass persecution and their fleeing en masse to the Americas, among other sites. Many of them were residing in Jamaica, then Spanish soil, until the arrival of the English in 1655, in which case they defected in huge numbers to the side of the invaders, emulating and providing a template for Africans subsequently. Thus, London encouraged migration of Sephardim to Jamaica, and just as the Spanish had co-opted countless Africans on English soil, the English returned the favor with the Iberian Jews. No synagogues were built in Jamaica until after the Spanish were ousted. Thus, just as London was forced to try to protect Africans under its jurisdiction from often harsh measures by settlers, English elites in the metropolis had to act similarly in Jamaica in overriding special taxes against Jews pursued by local elites. Oliver Cromwell had been scheming against Madrid virtually from the moment he seized office, that is, when he was not squabbling with Scots and Irish and other Englishmen. When he favored a compact with France over Dunkirk in 1651 and when in 1653 he attempted to draw the Dutch into a pact for the common conquest of Spanish America, it was Madrid that was on his mind. But the ongoing religious war intervened, especially with Paris when he sought assurances about the position of the Huguenots. As things turned out, his plotting was not for naught when Jamaica was taken from the Spanish in 1655. 
it was well that the Jewish population rallied to London's side in Jamaica for the Africans took the opportunity to become Maroons, that is, fleeing the Crown's jurisdiction and establishing independent communities on the island, raising the possibility of ousting European settlers altogether. London was obliged to negotiate seriously with these rebels and grant grudging concessions by the 1730s. Few slave societies, argues social historian Orlando Patterson, present a more impressive record of slave revolts than Jamaica, pointing to the 1673 rebellion, 200 Africans kill their master and 13 other Europeans, then plunder, and the 1678 uprising, which was similarly serious, then the 1690 conflagration, which may have been larger than those. The Maroons were implicated in the latter disturbance, and, as one subsequent report put it, poor white men were miserably butchered as hundreds revolted mayhem and murder ensued europeans were slaughtered indiscriminately and arms were seized by africans promising future unrest the authorities in jamaica were besieged william blathwaite who had oversight of the caribbean and north american colonies in the 1680s began to receive a steady stream of ever more disturbing reports about rebellious negroes in jamaica the militancy among Africans in Jamaica eventually made that of Barbados seem mild by comparison. Thus, by 1684, legislators in the former island were reminding settlers that slaveholders should search their property's houses diligently. Every fortnight for clubs, wooden swords, and mischievous weapons. Other laws guarded against the enslaved seeking to commit murder, rise in rebellion, or make any preparation of arms or conspire for that end, while any slave who sought to do any good service against the enemy, the French, shall forthwith be freed. But killing French, who fit snugly into the evolving potent category that was whiteness, might not have been the best incentive to dangle before Africans. For as was to be the case virtually until the end of colonialism in 1962, it was Jamaica that provided the most severe angst and angina for settlers. As one British writer put it in 1740, by 1690 the Negroes began to make disturbance, the runaways and those descended by the Spanish slaves, who were never conquered, began to make eruptions in the midst of unheard of barbarities, which caused other slaves to rebel. On one plantation, hundreds revolted, entered the big house, and murdered the master, and every white man that belonged to the plantation seized about fifty muskets, blunderbusses, and other arms, together with a great quantity of powder and shot. Then the Africans marched to the next plantation where they repeated their murders and killed every white man they could find. This gave impetus to what came to be called Maroon Wars that surged for decades until the 1730s settlement, what vast expense of blood and treasure the island expended to suppress the rebellious Negroes, it was said with dismay. Despair reigned among the colonists during this turbulent era. Neither the 1694 attack on Jamaica by the French nor the concomitant 1695 attack by London on neighboring Hispaniola settled things and, in fact, may have given impetus to the idea among Africans that the fate of these islands could only be settled by force of arms. Unsurprisingly, revolts by Africans in Jamaica occurred in 1694, 1702, and 1704 as tensions with competing European powers accelerated. Punishment was articulated for the enslaved who were so bold as to become involved in laying violent hands on their owners. A few years earlier, there was legislation promulgated concerning keeping the number of white men in proportion to the working slaves and to ensure that white men were sufficient, encouraging the importation of white servants was devised. A ship having 50 white male servants on board shall be free from port charges. Africans were barred from certain occupations in order to facilitate this European migration. Yet this latter population failed to grow in Jamaica between 1680 and 1756 and by 1774 were only 6.1% of the Isles population and by 1760 Jamaica endured Takis Rebellion, probably the most serious and long-lasting slave uprising in London's possessions, leading to a 1761 law designed to curtail the power of peoples of color generally, anticipating legislation in the region as well as in Bengal. However, the dilemma faced by London was exposed when the point is brooded about that bringing white or Irish settlers who might conspire with his Catholic Majesty or Scots, many of whom were not reconciled to being yoked in union with England, was hardly ideal.
but London had few viable options. By the 1660s, the idea of enslaving Europeans, even Irish and Scots, in the Caribbean was disappearing. Simultaneously, if not sooner, the terms Negro and slave were becoming synonymous on the mainland, and this equivalence may have emerged even earlier on Providence Island, the Puritan colony in the southwestern Caribbean. One contemporary scholar has found the first use of the generic noun white in January 1661. It is easy to infer that the colonizers came to recognize that simultaneous enslavement of Europeans and Africans was too formidable a task and that narrowing bondage to the latter was more practicable. Certainly this narrowing made more sense on the mainland, where competing European powers were quite close and indigenes seemed more fearsome. Moreover, and as will be detailed later, the construction of whiteness or the forging of bonds between and among European settlers across class, gender, ethnic, and religious lines was a concrete response to the real dangers faced by all of these migrants in the face of often violent rebellions from enslaved Africans and their indigenous comrades. Still, enslaving Africans was hardly a consolation prize, as evidenced by the London writer who acknowledged that in the 1680s, when English ships headed for the El Dorado that was Lima, Peru, the Spanish, hearing of their impending arrival, killed most of their slaves, fearing they should revolt from them to the English. Indeed, one English seaman related, there came a Negro to us, running away from the Spaniards. He informed us. If the Spaniards had not sent all the Negroes belonging to this city farther up into the country, out of our reach and communication, they would all undoubtedly have revolted to us. Such was the dilemma of the beset colonizing power in desperate search of a reliable labor force to exploit mercilessly. What poison should be picked, bellicose Africans or disgruntled Irish and Scots? It was during this time that legislators in Jamaica were formulating a law with a lamenting preamble, whereas the runaway and rebellious Negroes in this island have of late murdered several of the inhabitants, and have plundered and destroyed many of the small and out settlements, and do still in great numbers continue doing what robberies and other mischiefs they are able, and daily increase their numbers by other Negroes running away and joining with them, which may be of fatal consequence, the latter point was blunt understatement. As before, rewards were offered to Africans who participated in fighting the French, with little regard as to how this clashed with the goal of compelling slaves to fear humans defined as white. By 1703, caution was cast aside as a bill was devised to encourage the importation of white men in order to provide security. Little regard was accorded to the difficult reality that both Spanish and French foes could insinuate themselves into the colony since, after all, they could pass as white men too. Frankly, who was to say that a preferred French Huguenot was not actually a despised Catholic? Sadly for London, Jamaica was a bellwether for the region. Shipping networks carried news and updates about plots and schemes and wars from one island to another and to the North American mainland, along with printed books, pamphlets, and newspapers that substantiated oral reports. Things were so bad in Jamaica that by 1696 there was such fear that one official concluded morosely that even fleeing Europeans must of necessity fall in a short time into the hands of the enemy from abroad or the Negroes from within, neatly encapsulating the internal and external dilemmas faced by the colonizer. Before 1692, colonizers in Jamaica only had to worry about Negro insurrection combined with foreign invasion, but then in that fateful year, this anxiety was compounded with the arrival of a major earthquake. It was one of the worst in recorded history. A self-described truest and largest account of this epical event exuded anxiety with fear of the forcible invasion of barbarous French or insurrection of domestic slaves as the ground rumbled below. Of course, said a contemporaneous account, the first fears were concerning our slaves, those irreconcilable and yet intestine enemies of ours, who are not otherwise our subjects than as the whip makes them, who seeing our strongest houses demolished, our arms broken, and hearing of the destruction of our greatest dependency, the town of Port Royal, might in hopes of liberty be stirred up to rise in rebellion against us, that is, kill and slay all the whites, men, women, and children, combined. With the forcible invasion of our enemies, who see our hearts are low, our arms broken, our forts lacerated and useless. 
This analyst worried if the earthquake meant that God's will had spoken, surely the nightmare he conjured was reason for reconsideration of what was going on in Jamaica. Part of the problem was that after taking Jamaica in 1655, an intoxicated London thought it could use this island as a base to take Cuba, Hispaniola, and other glittering sources of wealth. London quickly found that to compete in this region it made sense to bow to best practices of colonialism, for example, those of Spain and France, which often deployed armed Africans, but as Britain came to see, this would only complicate relations with the settler class, which feared this trend as much as it feared foreign invasion. In the late 17th century, in one of the many examples of clashes between the colonial powers, France sought to oust the Spanish from Cartagena with a large fleet that included dozens of Africans from Hispaniola. These were the first to be ordered to embark ashore in South America and were crucial to the attack on this growing town of 20,000 that had a heavy concentration of Africans. At this juncture, colonial territories were up for grabs, and enlisting Africans on one side made sense. In 1678, the Frenchman Robert Cavalier de La Salle was confident that mulattoes, Indians, and Negroes once promised their liberty would assist Paris in driving the Spanish from Mexico. But how could this overture to mulattoes, Indians, and Negroes occur as colonial momentum was pointing toward the intensification of the degradation of these groups? London was hoisted on its own petard. By the late 17th century, the colonizing project presupposed enslavement of Africans, but, simultaneously, to gain an advantage against a European competitor could involve arming Africans, which could lead gradually away from the degradation that enslavement dictated, and, ultimately, toward abolition. Seeking to fortify colonialism by trying to deploy Irish Catholics invited their defection to the Catholic powers of Madrid and Paris, just as France had difficulty in deploying Protestant Huguenots for fear they might defect to Protestant London, yet France's slave code was not necessarily helpful in winning the hearts and minds of Africans. Paris was emulating London, which decades earlier had acquiesced to the ousting of the governor of Virginia in part because he was seen as insufficiently harsh toward Catholics and indigenes. Late 17th century realities were seemingly contradictory, arming Africans and enslaving Africans, incorporating religious dissidents and ousting religious dissidents. By 1684, realization of the racial stakes at play was slowly dawning on at least one Londoner, who wondered pensively, should a man be made a slave forever merely because his beard is red or his eyebrows black? Included in this premature abolitionism was an enlightening discourse in way of dialogue between an Ethiopian or Negro slave and a Christian that was his master in America. By 1693, Coincidentally, as demonstrated rage was rising in Jamaica and Barbados, a sober colonist in Philadelphia was arguing that Africans were a real part of mankind and reminding that in some places in Europe Negroes cannot be bought and sold for money or detained to be slaves. Therefore, he continued, in true Christian love we earnestly recommend it to all our friends and brethren not to buy any Negroes. By 1702, the famed Daniel Defoe was raising searching questions about the slave trade, though he later backtracked, but his initial skepticism was a reflection of the heavy price in lives and money brought by building slave labor camps. Yet another Londoner crowed about the growing greatness of distant colonies and the wealth and prestige these lands delivered, in contrast to the unrefined opinion of the famed novelist. However, the writer Richard Blome also complained about maltreatment of Africans in Barbados, not least since if this brutality were not eased, it would lead to crises that could ultimately throttle the goose that was laying these golden eggs in the form of mass rebellions of the enslaved. The point-counterpoint between enthusiasm for the wealth that slavery generated and apprehension about the bloodiness it engendered was reflected in a legal zigzag. Thus, as early as 1569, it had been decided that English law would not recognize the status of a slave. This was reversed in 1677, then reversed again before entering a kind of limbo that was clarified in June 1772. It may have been demanding too much to expect London to move toward abolition in the late 17th century in the face of debilitating unrest in the Caribbean. Expanding operations on the mainland as a hedge against further painful losses in the Caribbean, for example, that absorbed by Spain in Jamaica in 1655, had the added advantage of countering and blocking the Spanish in Florida and the French in the north and west on the mainland. 
London knew that, unlike diamonds, colonies were not forever, and, thus, opportunism was a necessity. This may have dawned on the famed diarist Samuel Pepys when he landed in Tangiers in September 1683 and confronted Morris far from delighted to see him. Tangiers was a possession of the crown beginning in 1661 and ending in 1684, shortly after he had arrived. The kind of anger Pepys witnessed in North Africa was mirrored, in spades, in the Caribbean, casting doubt on the future of the colonial enterprise there. Thus, as African rebelliousness surged, the besieged planter class of Barbados began a great trek to the mainland. By the late 17th century, Caribbean settlers and their enslaved Africans from this sugar island were trickling into Newport. By the 18th century, the Rhode Islanders had learned their lessons so well that this Atlantic town became a principal hemispheric slave market. There were 25 distillers making rum in Newport, and their busyness meant that a healthy African male could be bought for 115 gallons of rum, with only 95 gallons purchasing a female, who by rough means could be induced to produce even more chattel. Yet as important as Rhode Island was to slavery and as a refuge for retreating Caribbean colonists, it was far from being singular. By the summer of 1671, about half the Europeans and more than that of the Africans who were in South Carolina, in some ways the prismatic and paradigmatic province, which illuminated the mainland as a whole, hailed from Barbados. This trend continued for about two decades, at which point a continuing influx from Africa began to assert itself. During this earlier era, what became the Palmetto State was effectively an extension of this small island. There was also little doubt that tales of bloody resistance of the enslaved in the Caribbean indelibly marked Carolina, particularly since there was a high proportion of men from the Caribbean in the legislature that came to preside there. These men were still quite active in the 1690s, as they represented some of the wealthiest and most influential colonists on the mainland. Ultimately, Jamaica was to surpass Barbados and much of the mainland as a source of wealth for London, but before 1700, it was Barbados, though 25 times smaller than Jamaica, which far surpassed it in sugar production, a major source of riches. Carolina, as an extension of this small island, thus gained in importance, but did so while carrying fresh Caribbean memories of rebellious Africans more than willing to upset the status quo. Surely, news of African unrest in the Caribbean received a wide audience in Carolina. Certainly the racial ratios on the mainland were more forgiving and less dangerous for the settlers. Nonetheless, the colonists there discovered that what had beset them in the Caribbean, Negro insurrection and foreign invasion, had not been eluded by simple arrival on the mainland. The city that became Charleston, South Carolina, was the only real defensible port between Spanish Florida and the valuable real estate that Virginia had become, and with the chain being only as strong as its weakest link, subjugating the Palmetto province with the aid of disaffected Africans could jeopardize the entire colonial project on the mainland. By 1686, the Spanish from Florida had landed with a force of Africans and indigenes to launch a surprise attack on the Carolina settlers. This occurred 50 miles south of the population node that became Charleston. It was the typical warfare of the time, plunder, along with taking prisoners and murder, along with seizing about a dozen enslaved Africans. Obviously incentivized, the Spaniards attacked again in 1687 with the usual multiracial crew and the usual result, burning and pillaging. A hurricane had compelled their retreat to their base in St. Augustine, known to house an encampment of the settlers' disturbing nightmare, armed Africans. The English pillaged St. Augustine in 1702, but in the long term that only served to further enrage Africans, who scattered, recovered, and lived to fight another day. Juan Marquez Cabrera, who was part of the earlier attacking forces, reported that the enslaved he encountered asked him if he had some canoes in which to be able to flee with them and come to St. Augustine. It was not reassuring to Carolina settlers that Africans considered to be troublemakers in Havana were routinely dispatched to St. Augustine. Apparently, Carolina Africans were taken by these Spanish plunderers to Havana and in turn were capable of returning to their home eager to settle scores. That Carolina was facing an ongoing conflict with the indigenous that created a flood of African refugees heading southward to Florida only served to underline the fragility of this extension of Barbados on the mainland. 
for in 1693, His Catholic Majesty offered a kind of freedom to any enslaved African who escaped from British soil who would accept Christian conversion, which increased instability in Carolina. In turn, the Carolina elite tended to favor the arrival of French Huguenots rather than Catholics of any type. This influx of Europeans also contributed to the increased arrival of manacled Africans, given the Herculean task at hand in this vast land, and since some of these new settlers arrived from Hispaniola without their most valued property. Moreover, the proximity of a competing colonial power on Carolina's border provided opportunity to flee, and not just for Africans. As early as 1674, John Radcliffe, a yeoman servant, sought to run to Florida with, as colonial elites put it, two of his fellow servants along with him to the Spanish habitations, there to conspire and procure the ruin of this hopeful settlement and all his majesty's subjects therein. As South Carolina developed a Negro majority early on, there was little incentive to impose quality control on the type of Europeans who arrived, which came to include criminals of various types and political dissidents with little disincentive to conspire against London. The greatest desperadoes of the Western world landed there, according to one analyst, and that pirates were strung up at the entrance to the main port apparently did little to discourage their arrival. This frail reality was overlaid by antipathy toward the Spanish to the south, who returned the disfavor by an order of magnitude. For the Spaniards were able to do what the Carolinians were reluctant to pursue, form a regiment of Africans, in some cases composed of those escaping to Florida, arming them, and then unleashing them on a colony where they had scores to settle. Yet boldly, perhaps foolishly, the Carolina elite continued to import enslaved Africans, their population increasing nearly sixfold between 1685 and 1700. Moreover, Carolina's importance was underscored when it became the major point of entry for arriving Africans, who were then distributed throughout the mainland colonies. The estimate is that almost half of this group brought to the mainland from 1701 to 1775 were imported via Charleston, with a preference for Angolans, no strangers to warfare to this very day, and those with roots in today's Gambia and Senegal. Suggestive of the breadth and depth of the developing slave trade was that as early as the 1690s, mainland settlers and their suppliers had rounded the Cape and had begun kidnapping Africans from Madagascar for forced labor in English possessions. That this was an unwise source of supply became clear when it emerged that those from Madagascar had become leaders of the Maroon Wars. But the profits were simply too handsome to ignore. Slave labor camps on the mainland stocked with workers from Madagascar were part of a profitable trade that deposited tobacco into some of the most elegant pipes in London. Others from the east of Africa may also have made it across the Atlantic at this time, not least because the mainlanders early on proved themselves to be masters of smuggling, thereby defeating the keenest statistician. The profits from the slave trade and the profits wrung from slave labor created an indecent circle of riches that fed upon itself, while infuriating Africans and making them even more susceptible to seditious appeals. This was occurring even though there was constant nervousness about what legislators referred to as the designs of the Spaniards, and the French too. Not only were Africans being referred to in English by the Spanish word for black, some mainlanders had begun to view this seditious labor supply as being, almost inherently, agents of Catholicism, no small point as religious conflict raged. Despite this fright, the colonists persisted in selling what were described as rebellious and runaway Africans to the Spanish West Indies, which required seasoned Negroes for mines, though these disgruntled workers could just as soon return arms in hand and eager to inflict pain on their former captors. This was also occurring as Europeans themselves had to worry about their own compatriots being swept into slave markets in northern Africa and further to the east of Europe, which, at least, was suggestive of what a terrible destiny and what a frightening counter-reaction enslavement could engender if one's cards were not played properly. Ultimately, it is estimated that thousands of individuals with roots in the sceptered isle alone suffered through this plight. Mainlanders may have understood this from first-hand experience when in 1654 the Dutch from New Amsterdam conquered Delaware and reputedly sold the defeated Swedes into slavery in Virginia. The point was that when subsequently mainland settlers came to fear that London was plotting with Africans against them, there was reason to suspect that they were not simply hallucinating, for back then, numerous Europeans were suffering an even more horrible fate difficult to envision today.
Delaware was an emblem of the riotous instability on the mainland that could allow Africans and indigenes alike to seize advantage. For beginning in the mid-17th century until the beginning of the 18th, Europeans of various sorts were at each other's throats. The Dutch ousted the Swedes, who were in turn ousted by the English, just as in what is now New York, the English surged to power in 1664, then were ousted by the Dutch in 1673, before returning to power shortly thereafter. It was not easy for Africans to believe in the mystique of the power of whiteness, as propounded by the English, when Londoners were being repeatedly ousted. At the same time, the unstable and unsettled nature of colonialism provided more leverage and arbitrage opportunities for Africans. Furthermore, because of the threat from the indigenous and European powers, the colonists were forced into the ultimate indignity, arming Africans, a textbook example of tempting fate. The militia system in South Carolina, designed to repel invaders and the seditious alike, was probably more comprehensive in scope than that of any of the other original 13 colonies, not least because of proximity to Spanish soil and the presence of a large African population. Naturally, it was modeled after that of Barbados, which faced similar challenges. A 1708 Carolina census revealed the presence of a population of 9,580, including 1,800 enslaved African men, 1,100 enslaved African women, and 1,200 enslaved African children. Of this population, only 950 white men were available for military duty, a laughably small number given the threats faced, as the greater majority of the Europeans consisted of women and children deemed hardly suitable for martial duty. Carolina was the firewall that protected Virginia, the mainland's trophy colony, from Spanish depredations. This protection facilitated the rise of such grandees as William Byrd, who over a span of 30 years in the late 17th century amassed almost 30,000 acres of land. By the 1680s, for the mainland pattern, he had switched almost wholly to the exploitation of enslaved Africans as opposed to European servants. Naturally, this trend produced unease, with cries about the growing presence of Africans emerging as early as 1677. This was understandable since plots by servants had become prevalent by the early 1660s. The famed Bacon's Rebellion has been described as a civil war as much as an insurrection spearheaded by servants. There were about 2,000 slaves and 6,000 servants in the colony's 40,000 strong population. As tabulated, the indigenous population also has to be accounted for when assessing the balance of class and racial forces. The growth in the population of enslaved Africans, their numbers reputedly tripled between 1680 and 1690, happened to occur as the more encompassing category of whiteness ascended and, perhaps, as a result of this abortive revolt. This rebellion, according to a recent study, illustrates the illiberality of the settlers, making it difficult to swallow wholly the progressiveness of their revolt against London a scant century later, for, it is reported, driving this rebellion was a settler desire to enforce a quicker extermination of the indigenous, which was thought to be resisted by London's delegates. After this revolt, religion and race, which pointedly excluded Africans, helped to bond the colonial elite and European servants. The discernible trend on the mainland in the late 17th century was the growth and importance of the enslaved African population as the economy grew, particularly vis-a-vis -vis the population of European servants. At a time when there were servants of European descent, indigenous and African slaves, and free Africans, the latter could belong to the militia and were expected to arm, though masters were not required to provide arms for slaves after 1640 but presumably could do so if they wished. Even Nathaniel Bacon, whose revolt took aim at the indigenous, enrolled in his ranks European servants and enslaved Africans. This was also suggestive of the reality that a flood of Africans, with a resultant fear of their presence, had yet to descend on the colony. By one estimate, there were 500 Africans in Virginia in 1645 and 2000 in 1660. This situation was to change dramatically in coming years, which did not tend to reduce the danger of exploiting slaves. The continuing arrival of embittered Africans had predictable consequences. By June 1680, there was legislation for preventing Negroes' insurrection. That this bill had little evident effect on subsequent events did not seem to deter the authorities. 
Reliance on the labor of enslaved Africans brought real danger, a reality that emerged when in 1687 a conspiracy of the enslaved was uncovered in the northern neck region of Virginia, with the aim including, according to an official report, destroying and killing. The Negro conspirators were in custody, but it was not self-evident that this, as was suggested, would deter other Negroes from plotting, particularly since the design of the plotters was carrying it through the whole colony of Virginia. That this was taken seriously was implied when in 1688 the authorities discussed a stricter law to be made for prevent insurrections of Negroes, which was supplemented in 1693. Thus, by 1691, there were rampant complaints about problems of runaways committing depredations, and the conclusion emerged that such Negroes, mulattoes, or slaves resisting, running away, or refusing to surrender may be killed and destroyed, with compensation to master for slave killed as a powerful incentive. A European bond or free intermarrying with a Negro, mulatto, or Indian was to be banished forever, thus hastening the consolidation of whiteness. However, by 1700, there were an estimated 20,000 Africans in Virginia, and according to T.H. Breen, as a direct result, whites had achieved a sense of race solidarity at the expense of blacks, a landmark in the evolution of mainland colonies. This pan-European bonding came with a steep price. By 1710, the Byrd family was facing a report of a conspiracy of the enslaved to rise against their captors. We directed the Negroes to be arraigned for high treason, it was said, though a mere legal arrangement could not reduce the unsteadiness delivered by bonded labor. In spite of the dangers in the mainland colonies, it did appear at first glance that a master stroke had been executed by colonists by escaping from the Caribbean to the mainland. Assuredly, the racial ratios were more appealing than those of, for example, Barbados and Jamaica, though the problem for the settlers was that a continent required many more enslaved Africans than an island, thus multiplying the danger for London. For as Carolina and Virginia suggested, escaping the wrath of rebellious Africans and their allies would require more than a simple boat ride northward. Yet, with all the problems provided by the mainland, it seemed a tonic compared to small islands seemingly more subject to internal subversion and external attack. This may have occurred to the governor of Antigua in 1709 when he was the target of a murderous attack led by an angry African. Sandy, the African, was accused of acting on behalf of the executive's opponents, yet another example of the opportunities for arbitrage created by enslavement. This assassination attempt came on the heels of a murder of a slaveholder a few years earlier when he refused his enslaved labor force a Christmas holiday. It was dreadful, said one analysis, as they actually hacked him to death. His Excellency, however, escaped with mere fractured bones and a shriveled arm that had lost mobility and, it was said, a great deal of torture after a large musket ball hit his exposed limb. The assailant, London was told, was a very noted fellow who was very remarkable for his courage and his skill as a good marksman, being a native of the place and employed to shoot wild pigeons. An evil parson was blamed for this mess, but the colonizers in London too came to recognize that the difficult geography and demography of small islands had to be obviated in the long run. Unlike the mainland, small islands such as Antigua provided little room for an orderly retreat by terrorized settlers. Evaluating to the mainland would also mean a need for a larger encampment of slave labor to subdue a vast continent. Plus, another demerit for the Caribbean, from London's viewpoint, was that it was easier for the enslaved to flee a small island, albeit via swimming and or a hijacked vessel, than a sprawling continent, and war between and among the powers only lubricated this path, a policy encouraged by competitors. That the enslaved would do so at crop time wounded the colonizer more deeply. Serendipitously, for the settlers, the erosion and influence of the Royal African Company meant free trade in Africans, facilitating the spectacular growth of the enslaved population. But this jolt of adrenaline to the mainland economy also delivered terror in the form of rebellious Africans. <laughs>